don't care whether you've never listened to anyone before in your life. I am begging you right now. If you don't disperse right now, they're going to move in, and it can only be a slaughter. Would you please listen to me? Jesus Christ, I don't want to be a part of this. Please. I'm begging you also. Follow me out this way. Glenn William Frank was born January 13, 1928, in Mayfield Heights, Ohio, to school teachers Harold and Gertrude Frank. His father later became the superintendent of the Mayfield Heights School District. His sister Ruth has said that when he was growing up, the worst thing she can remember Glenn doing was shooting out a car window with his BB gun. Otherwise, Glenn's life was fairly uneventful, full of the sort of activities many young boys had. Playing ball, scouting, or doing most anything outdoors seemed to keep him especially happy. In school, he was less successful. An average student, he would only blossom in college. Like a lot of boys, he took odd jobs to earn his money. Sometimes he dug graves at the local cemetery. And as a member of the Teamsters, he also drove a milk delivery truck. As a young teenager during World War II, he served in the Civil Defense Corps, earning a certificate as a messenger. It would not be the last time he would try to help to bring peace. In 1945, Glenn graduated from Mayfield High School, joining the Marine Corps, serving from 1946 to 1947, when he spent his time training in Paris Island, South Carolina. Leaving the Marines, he married Betty Louise Dahlgren on November 25, 1949 and together they raised two sons, Alan and Ronald, and a daughter, Linda. In 1951, Glenn enrolled at Kent State University on the GI Bill. As a geology student, Glenn spent his summer prospecting way up into northern Canada, where he went looking for uranium and gold. Returning to campus, he was mentored and inspired by Dr. Carl Savage, a colleague who became the director of the geology department. Glenn graduated from Kent in 1951, and then from 1952 to 1953, he served as an assistant geologist for the state of Maine. Frank earned Master of Science degrees from both the University of Maine in 1953 and Western Reserve University in Cleveland in 1963. Though he never obtained his doctorate, his enthusiasm for his field and his dedication to his teaching, the numerous teaching awards he won, all contributed to his being addressed as Dr. Frank by his students. He then accepted a temporary teaching assignment at his alma mater, a tenure that stretched 31 years and would leave behind a legacy much more solid than those rocks he had loved. But Glenn said he wasn't always so gung-ho about teaching. In fact, he originally considered a job as an oceanographer until, as he said, he realized that he had a deathly fear of water. Over that 31 years, Glenn would earn the respect of his colleagues at Kent and around the world. He especially enjoyed taking his field trips, which included experimental classes in the Catskill Mountains, work on Mount Desert Island, Maine, and the Black Hills in South Dakota. Late in his career, he went to Antarctica with fellow geologists, a trip which earned the participants congressional medals from the National Science Foundation. Back home at Kent, he developed a forensics geology course in which students would analyze how to use earth materials to solve a crime. Rather than simply spoon-feeding information, Frank challenged his students to analyze mock crime scenes in class projects. The professor had already been using these same techniques to begin his understanding of the crime scene on the Kent Commons. His desire to understand, perhaps to solve, the mystery of what he saw that warm afternoon in May would form the longest research project and the one he wished most to solve before his life ended. Glenn Frank said, sometimes more important than teaching is making the students aware of how to find the answers to questions. And in his own life, he continued that statement to include those questions that must be answered. In the years following his retirement, Glenn would put these same principles to use, laboriously studying, dissecting, and investigating the crime scene that formed the pivotal moment of his response to the shootings. It was the center of his finest moment. 
During the days preceding the shootings on the campus, Glenn accepted responsibility as a peace marshal, and wearing his armband, he went down to the commons to take up his watch. In the moments following the 13 seconds of gunfire, it is Glenn Frank's voice that rises above the fray, calling to the crowd in his emotionally charged voice to disperse. In that moment, Glenn Frank became melded with the history that would make Kent State synonymous with the Vietnam War, the end of the 60s, the unthinkable act of death to student dissent. It was a moment that would change a nation and a man. For the next 20 years, Frank used all of the intellectual gifts of his profession, as well as the compassion that exploded in those moments, to sift through the evidence, interpret the facts, and try to elicit, in interview, letter, and document, those missing pieces of the puzzle that became a central focus of his life. The end of Glenn Frank's life was a beginning of the search for the answers to those 13 seconds. In his unpublished manuscript, Frank has left his research and his legacy that we, who are left behind, will, as his students, continue to seek the answers to the questions he has raised. Glenn once wrote that he adopted the Boy Scout oath as the embodiment of what he was striving for in his own life. I'm not always successful, he would say, but I shall never stop trying to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. It was a promise he kept.